People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Dora and I are thrilled to have our guest today on Health Gig, and it is the one and only Bridget Moynihan. And you may know her as an actress, you may know her as a model. Dora and I are lucky enough to know her as a friend. And today we talked to her about what it was like modeling right out of high school, what it was like to make the career change from modeling to acting, and what it's like to be on Blue Bloods for 13 years and do it so well and so consciously. Anyway, we can't wait for you to know Bridget the way we do. Bridget, welcome. Thank you. Very happy to be here. I mean, it's not every day that we get an actress, a leading lady on our podcast, so we're very excited. But we wanted to start, because we have so much to talk about, just hearing about your parents. I know they were educators and how you grew up and do you have siblings? And <laughs> Every, uh, Our listeners want to know a little bit. Oh, they want to know. They want to know. I grew up in Longmeadow, Massachusetts, for the most part, and my father worked at a bunch of different companies, and he had a doctorate in chemistry, and he was working at UMass, first in the polymer department, and then also in, you know, some intellectual property division. You know, he was a smarty pants. My mom was a history teacher when they first got together, but then she was a full-time mom for most of, you know, all of our education and our lives. I have two brothers. One lives upstate, one lives in Pennsylvania. I was stuck in the middle <laughs> and um, a lot of boy cousins. So I ended up being a little bit more of a tomboy, whether it was because of all that, all the cops and robbers that we played and, <laughs> you know, having to fight for my right in a house full of boys. <laughs> And playing sports, I think that fed my energy and my personality. You were the captain of three, right, teams in yes. high school? Yes. That's impressive. You know what? I wear that badge really quite proudly still. <laughs> I bet. It was soccer, basketball, and lacrosse? Yeah. Wow. That's wow, so big. It's, you know, for girls, I think it's a really character building and kids in general. It's great to keep them involved with sports these right. days. So they're focused on that, on right. competition and exercise and responsibility and right. showing up for other people. And, mm -hmm. you know, there's just so much value in it. So you you have this wonderful childhood, right? And high school's going great. So when did the whole thing, when did things change? Like when did the whole modeling thing start and how did it start? So I had a girlfriend, Carrie, from down the block <laughs> who wanted to be a model, I guess. And so she asked, since I had the car, she asked me if I would take her down to John Casablanca Modeling Center in Springfield, Massachusetts. And I took her down. And the woman there, Valerie, told us about the modeling program and Carrie wanted to do it. And she said, but what about you? And I was like, what? And honestly, I was doughy. Like, I had a very round face. I don't know why she saw something in me, because I don't remember kind of looking at myself that way. So that started it off. Wow. My first job was scuba diving catalog. And I think I got paid like $60 an hour. And I was like, it was a lot of money. Yeah. It is, by the way. It is. And you're, you were a senior in high school at this point? No, you had graduated. I think the summer before college. college. Okay. Mm -hmm. Got it. I don't think a lot of people know that your real name is Catherine, right? I didn't and, know that. No. But then I read that there were too many Catherines at the agency, so you decided to go by your middle name, which is Bridget. Yeah. I never really quite liked the name Bridget when I was growing up. I don't know. It just seemed too exotic or <laughs> it's very irish your parents it's are very irish, irish americans right so mm -hmm. that yep. made a lot of sense that your name was bridget and so yeah. so you're signed up they discover you who what's her name valerie 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 discovers you you have your first gig and then what happens you were telling us that this is before like cell phones and things right I suppose I did odd jobs out of Springfield for a second, and then Valerie wanted me to go to New York City. And I had, at that point, signed on to Elite Models because she took me to a convention there and blah, blah, blah. But at this point, she's supposed to be bringing me into the city for me to live there with my big bath and, like, <laughs> I'm going to live there in the modeling apartment. And she didn't show up. Oh, 
oh, oh. okay. <laughs> and I'm on the train and my dad's standing above me. I still have to go. And he didn't know what to do. He was so scared. And the train started moving. I'm like, you have to get off the train, dad. And it was so terrifying for him. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know what possessed them <laughs> to allow me to do this. And I think I cried the yeah. whole way to the city. I was yeah. so scared. I don't think I had ever left Massachusetts or Connecticut, Vermont, you know, like New England oh. at that point. And but I certainly hadn't gone somewhere by myself. So you get to New York and then it just sort of starts. You explained you ended up all over the world, right? Yeah, mostly in Europe, like Milan, London, Paris. I didn't do Japan or Germany or... Did you like it? Was it fun? It was a lot of fun. It was challenging. It was completely out of the box. I was traveling everywhere, meeting random people and going to different shoots. And, you know, it really has the uh, circus kind of yeah. life yeah, mentality. Yeah. What was the modeling world like? We read a lot about it or hear that there's all kinds of anorexia and starving and things like that. Is that what you found it to be? I would say there's elements of that. There's times of that. I certainly knew some young women who explored that. And then, yes, there was drugs, there was parties, there was drinking, there were playboys, there was all this stuff. You know, yeah. there's certainly been a lot of conversations in the news lately, whether it was, you know, Jean-Luc out of Paris, who was accused, and I think he's on trial now, or maybe that's passed, for taking advantage of young women. I mean, that was certainly was never talked about at that mm -hmm. time, but that was definitely my generation yeah. of models. And I keep hearing more and more stories of some of my peers that had to deal with that. How did you stay grounded to, to what you were doing there and not get sucked into all that? I don't know. I mean, I definitely flirted with it a lot, but I think that I kept coming back to my family. Mm -hmm. And I think, again, sports, I think sports, mm -hmm. being in that kind of environment helped me with my confidence and my mm -hmm. independence and focus. But certainly, you know, a strong family bond kept me grounded right and friends yeah, i would imagine i mean you're young and now you're over in europe and you were saying too before like again it wasn't like you could call every day at home but it was just knowing they were there yep. right they were like yeah i know you guys remember like phone boxes yeah. or oh my gosh yeah phone booths. <laughs> like no my son doesn't know what that is no right right you know right. or a filofax where you had everything in there now it's all in your phone right you know these kids right. don't know and we all have these apps now where you can track your kid no matter where right. you are. And right. my poor parents had no right. idea what country I was in. Yeah. And I didn't call them for yeah. weeks. Yeah. <laughs> I owe them such an apology. <laughs> We'd call the operator back then, too. Remember, we, yeah. <laughs> you know, can you please connect? That's me? right. So, Bridget, yeah. so how long were you doing all of the modeling? Like, what period was that? And then you moved to acting. But how did that transition or what happened? I think that a... So that was 1990, 91 that I got into modeling, 1990. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then I was in that for a good 10, 15 years, I think. Yeah. Anyway, then I did a lot of commercials, and commercials paid really well mm -hmm. back then. And I think that first commercial I got, I don't know if it was for Caress Before You Dress or <laughs> one of those things. I would always say I was the cleanest model in the business because I shampoo, <laughs> face cleansers, body washes, whatever. That first commercial, you get residuals. They sign you on for a certain amount, and then they keep running it, and you keep getting checks. Yeah. So I was like, "This is good. This is a nice. Yeah. This is a nice gig." I remember speaking to an actress one time in the bathroom when we were, you know, getting our makeup done. Like, how do you do it? Like, how do you get excited mm. to, I don't know, sell that cat food or whatever? Right. And she's like, she was kind of snarky about it, but she was like. This is my only job. I don't get to rely on my looks as a model. And I was like, huh, I know that was supposed to be me, right. but I'm going <laughs> to take that as a form of inspiration. Yeah. And I changed my whole outlook with that comment. And I started going to every job like, 
I needed that job, right. that I didn't have another source. Right. Of I did end up going to acting class in New York, and I did acting class with a woman named Kay Michael Patton, who was Meisner-based, and I took classes at night so that I could still work during the day. And I gave myself like a time limit. I would study for a couple of years, and then I would then start auditioning because I didn't want to start auditioning and not be ready. Not that you're always ready, but I knew that like if I started auditioning and I just wasn't prepared or confident about that, mm -hmm. I might not be asked back. And I didn't want to burn those opportunities, mm -hmm. those um, waste the moment. And then I gave myself another time limit of like audition, give yourself three years. And if you're not breaking in, then let's move on to something else. I think my parents kept saying to me, like, when are you going to get a real job mm -hmm. and go to business school or whatever it was? Mm -hmm. It was always business school, but modeling wasn't a real job. Acting wasn't really right. a real job. So it was always like, when are you going to do it? Meanwhile, I kept having a lot of success. I'm like, wait, when are you going to consider this? Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> going to notice. <laughs> yeah. What was your first break in acting and what was that like? It all kind of happened at the same time. You know, I did some small roles like girl number three on the bench in random movies, you know. But then right at the same time, I got a small independent called In the Weeds. And then I got Coyote Ugly and I got Sex in the City mm. all at the same wow. time. Wow. But yeah, then it kind of shifted a little bit like, you know, because there are large blocks of time between one gig to another, even though... You may have shot three things. Right. You might not work for X amount of months. I see. And so I remember my mom saying, I'm really sorry that I can't help you. I can't open any doors for you. I have no connections in that business, which I thought was really quite really sweet, sweet that she was concerned and wished, you know, wanted to do something for me. But I was like, I'm doing I, okay. I it. So, okay. So like when you just told us that, do you go, I can't believe that happened? Or is that, this is it, this is your life, this is all part of it? Because it's like, that's incredible. Were you like, I can't believe this is me? Yeah, totally. By the way, it yeah. still is, <laughs> right? Still is. And that was also like, again, like people don't know what a phone booth right. is, like with this generation, <laughs> but we also didn't have Instagram. Right. All this social media at that time, which is a blessing in a lot of ways, but then also like you didn't have this additional platform to be kind of promoting right. yourself and everything. Again, I think I'm very lucky that I didn't grow up as a teenager or young adult during this time with social yeah. media. Yeah. Can we start with Sex in the City? <laughs> yeah, tell us. Because, <laughs> I mean, you played Natasha and Mr. Big's yeah. wife. What was that like? And how was it with all Every the, <laughs> your co-stars? And what was all that like? It was scary to me. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, they were all so accomplished. And I didn't really have any work with most of the cast. I really worked with Chris Noth and with Sarah Jessica Parker. And Chris, like, didn't really pay attention. I was just some, you know, young <laughs> actress coming on. He was like, who is it? You know, he was fine. Now he's like, hey. I remember going to those shoots and they were so big and obviously everybody loved the show. It was a huge thing. And I just, I was so nervous. I was so nervous. I'm like, oh my God. I had one line, by the way. And it was, <laughs> I think it was nice to meet you. So like, I can say that. <laughs> it shouldn't have been like that stressful, but... I had never been on a show like that before. Oh, my God. I was so scared. I always have the analogy of, like, double Dutch. And the show is so, it's already moving. And you better be able to jump in and not trip on that rope yeah. and jump back out. You know, yeah. okay, that is scary. That's a good analogy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I know I had to yeah. pause for a minute. I'm double dutching. I'm like, yeah. oh my god, that's right. <laughs> but I can't double dutch. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> and then it turned into like I didn't know what their intention was with that role, but it turned into a, like a season and a half, wow. and then Amazing. a small role in this past movie, and just like that. So I was happy that they brought me back. And that was 10 years later, or what was that? I think it was maybe more. 
Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I the characters like are maybe 20. in their fifties. Yeah. So we're yeah. in twenty. Yeah. Right. right, right oh, that's right. neat. That's so neat. I mean, it's wow. probably more than twenty. That's incredible. So, yeah. Sex in the City. Wow. And so that all happened right at the same time as Coyote Ugly. Mm-hmm. Said. So, how did that go? Like, tell us about Coyote Ugly. <laughs> That was also incredibly, I remember there was an actress who was like, said something about Jerry Bruckheimer. I'm like, I don't even know who Jerry Bruckheimer is because (laughs) I didn't grow up in the business and I didn't pay attention. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) suddenly I'm filming this movie where they have a training with trainers and have a nutritionist and we're working on choreography and it was just massive and I didn't realize I was suddenly part of Jerry Bruckheimer's his movies are huge and he's a machine and I think when it really hit me was I don't know I was driving up Sunset Boulevard and there's this one building on Sunset Boulevard and I don't know maybe before La Cienega or I don't know what the street is but it's an entire building and it's probably eight stories high maybe taller and it's always for the big blockbuster advertisements and there was the poster of all the Coyote Ugly Girls. I said to myself that, you know, I won't go to LA unless I have a job. I like how I give myself these, like, little things. Right, right. (laughs) (laughs) These little goals. And so I went to LA for Coyote Ugly. And then how long did you stay there? I think that I was there on and off for I don't know how many years, frankly. Mm -hmm. You know, living between New York and LA and and wherever the movies took you. I mean, you've been in lots of movies, like, I don't know how many, 12 or 13 or 15. I have no idea. I did not keep count. Okay. Well, you've been in a lot. (laughs) What's been your favorite to work on? I can't say there's one. I think there's something incredible about every single one. Yeah. And that's one of those things that, you know, whether it's a big movie or a small movie, you're always walking away with something, you know? So you have to memorize your lines. Yes. Right, obviously. <laughs> That's helpful. <laughs> That's helpful. And is that challenging for you or that was something, did you pick up pretty quick or how did that go for you? I just work at it. I go through the material multiple times in different ways and for different reasons. But like I remember in high school, like if I had to memorize something, I would really have a hard time memorizing it verbatim. Like there would be always some weird twist that I put on it. Right. And I think I sometimes still, well, certainly on this job, I still do. But there are certain creators and writers like Aaron Sorkin who would not put up with that. So That's even right. though it is a dream of mine to work with him, right? I would definitely have to shift the way I do things because I would love to work with him. He's such a smart writer and I always appreciate his work, but I know I'd have to do something different. Has it got cool. easier to memorize lines or harder? Well, I've been on the same show for a long time. Yeah. For 13 years. So now it's kind of, yeah. that's easier for me now because it's that character. And it's the same writers consistently. It's interesting when you have somebody completely different writing for your character who has a different cadence or rhythm in the way they write. And it's really suddenly becomes hard to wrap your mouth around the words and have them sound natural because it's somebody else writing it. So you had said too that you love what you do now for lots and lots of reasons, but you had never really aspired to wanting to have like the Bridget Moynihan show, right? You didn't really want to have to be every single day doing that. Is that right? I think that that was probably something like, yeah, I can do a single female lead. Yeah, I should do that. And coming from film, that was definitely like, you can do that and you should do that as your agents are promoting you. I did a show called Six Degrees, which was a great show. It definitely came before its time. We should revamp that for sure. A smart idea and great writing, great cast. I think it was on ABC. It only lasted one season, but it was an ensemble. Mm -hmm. For some reason, the whole story ended up really kind of leaning into my world. So people would come in and out of my world. I just remember like I was working more than I expected with that Mm -hmm. big of a cast. And there was an actress, a great actress on the Mm -hmm. show, Hope Davis, and she had two young kids. And I remember thinking, 
oh my God, these hours. I am so lucky not to be a mom and pulling these hours. And I remember thinking, okay, I don't think I want to do a single female lead because it's really demanding. And like I got pregnant on that show. So I knew I was going to be a mom and I had seen how Hope was juggling it all. And I said, I don't want a single female lead responsibility when I'm a mom. And yet you're one of the few women actors to stay on a series for more than a decade. It sounds like you found the right niche. I did. Donnie Wahlberg came to me 13 years ago and said we had done a pilot together before that in Boston. So I had thought, okay, Boston story, this is great. His dad, my son's dad lives there. I can get the whole family in one place and that will be better for my son. The show didn't get picked up. So when Donnie came back to me with Blue Bloods, I thought, okay, well, that's in New York. That's closer to Boston. Let's do this. It has been such a gift to be in one place, have stability for my son and flexibility because it's a big cast. Yeah. And I have days off right. because of that big cast. So what's your schedule like on Blue Buds and what's a typical day like? Well, it was much busier in the first half of our series, right? We worked a lot longer hours. We've gotten it to a rhythm now and we've gotten, you know, people's storylines kind of balanced. I did all my work for this episode last week, so I'm wow. not working this week. And that's just the way it oddly wow. worked out. And that has a lot to do with location, the type of script, all of the other actors and their responsibilities. So it just worked out that way. But I could probably, you know, work two or three days a week. So when you're not working, what are you doing? Well, this year I helped produce a short that got accepted to the Beverly Hills Film Festival. Wow. And we are pitching it as a TV show. So that's something I'm trying to go into. I directed the last couple of years. So that's something I've been exploring and having a good time with. And then yeah, do my right, do younger, thing. I was really, you know, being a mom, going to the games and doing that. And da, da, da. now he's a teenager. He's like, it's odd how that shift so happened so quickly. <laughs> we just had on our podcast this morning, we recorded with Mary Louise Kelly, who's written a book called It Goes So Fast. <laughs> and it, it talks about exactly what you just said. It does go so fast. And so it's that you so had that time, some time anyway, to be with him is great. So what's so incredible about you? So many things are so incredible Tell about me. you. But <laughs> yeah, we will, we will. But you are one courageous person. Yes. I mean, courageous comes up for me. Brave comes up for me. Dora, what else comes up? Confident. Yes, <laughs> confident. From sports. Likeable. Completely oh. likeable. Beautiful <laughs> on the inside. Yes. As beautiful as you are on the outside. Oh. And how you have made your life decisions to create the life you have now is remarkable, Bridget. Like it's not what, it sometimes isn't the way stories are told. Do you know what I mean? And you've just seemed to maneuvered through making decisions, learning, taking snarky comments from people and being able to get the <laughs> get the good out of it. You have a way of looking at things that way, which is pretty remarkable. Yeah, it's a good skill. You know, mm -hmm. it keeps you kind of out of the drama a lot of the time. Yes. Yeah. You know, and getting caught up in drama is just like exhausting and time consuming and Oh, it's just so funny to hear an actress, a really successful actress, say, I'm just not into drama. <laughs> you, know, you have to really pick your drama. That. But you, you yeah. actually created a life that's as low profile as you could make it, correct, in that way? Yeah. It's not easy in no. this day and age with, you know, first of all, when you're um, any type of celebrity who is having a baby, whether you're yeah. with the partner or not, they assault the woman and it's awful what they do to any pregnant woman who happens to be in the limelight and then all that time afterwards which you guys know you've given birth you don't feel your best and right exhausted nobody tells you what your body is doing right. and looking like after you have a baby <laughs> right you don't so you don't so so. Not emotionally prepared for that you know and then you're being hounded by the paparazzi. And that's what I find so fascinating by a lot of celebrities now 
they, which I didn't necessarily do or know how to do, and maybe it's not in my personality either, but there's a lot of people who embrace that attention. Mm -hmm. It's not necessarily for me. I really can appreciate the reasons why they might be doing it. Being sort of incognito in some circumstances has made your life a little bit easier and maybe yes. the life of your son a little bit easier. Yes. I mean, I really embraced the mask, the coronavirus mask. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. I don't think I'm ready to give that up. <laughs> Being a single mom, how was that early years? Was it difficult or you had said too that you were really fortunate that you had a great people that helped you? Yeah, as I mean, as a, mom. I was a single mom, but I also had support of my family. Yeah. I had somebody helping me out. Obviously, I needed somebody to help me out because I was working. My son's father is in the picture, which is fantastic. Like, a lot of people don't have that. Right. So single mom is a very broad term, mm -hmm. and I'm very honest in knowing that I'm on a very privileged end of that, of having the support I have from friends and family and et cetera. What advice would you give to women who find themselves in the same circumstances you had? Well, I don't know. I, I mean, again, I think my circumstances were unique. Yeah. I can imagine single moms who are actually, you know, having to rely on daycare immediately and putting their little infant newborn into some kind of Mm -hmm. group care and then having to do maybe two jobs, maybe one, like it's hard. Mm -hmm. It's uh, remarkable that they find the energy to do it because I'm a firm believer in a lot of napping. Right. <laughs> and, you can, and you can't do that without a very strong support system. Yeah. That's so true. So are you a good sleeper? I didn't think I was a good sleeper, but I just got this aura ring and I'm really oh, like yes, we have really too. getting into Gorn the app and checking out my numbers and it makes a difference when you can measure it. If you're the type that gets motivated by that and it doesn't stress you out, it is so helpful yeah. to kind of know what happened in terms of your sleep. You're right. And you can measure it and then try to work on it. And oh, that's good. That's good. Yeah. So you're a good sleeper, sleeper. with your aura <laughs> ring. What about, we had a glimpse of how you take <laughs> care of yourself because we saw you run up and down a very steep set of stairs. So what did you do? A like, period of time. Like 52 times. And, you know, after you left, I said to Dora, come on, we have to go do oh, that yeah. now. Oh, this was really competitive. <laughs> so she said, come on. And I'm like, I have jet lag, so I'm not thinking about doing that right now, but I did it. And I'm like, was it 52 back and forth or was it 52 up and down, up and down? <laughs> yeah. So we had to. Two, one, two, two. Yeah, that's three. what we had to do. That's what I told we them. That's what we had to do. Thing. <laughs> but anyway, so you're obviously very fit. And yes. how do you take care of yourself, mind, body, and spirit? Yeah. Physically, I think that, you know, it changes year after year injury to injury. Right. And, you know, now it's a bit more walking and swimming and more exercises that are trying to lengthen and tone. And But before, you know, in my younger age, it was soccer, basketball, lacrosse, mm -hmm. tennis, you know, all that, a lot of roller skating. Fun. Throw a sport at me and I would have done it. Pickleball now. So fun. Mm -hmm. I got into biking, like road biking over COVID. So I was really motivating myself to do like 100 miles a week. Also carving out that time given all the responsibilities. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I think that's also important to switch it up so that you're staying fresh and motivated. You have a nice husband named Andrew. <laughs> a you. And what is, does he do all that too? He's a runner, though he's not supposed to be. <laughs> and he tries to do some swimming. He plays golf. He definitely stays active. Basketball was in his life. All the kids play basketball. So golf mm -hmm. is kind of like that fun sport that you can go out and do with the family. He does not mm -hmm. ski. We all ski. But he's good with coming anyway. You know, and it's nice to have a partner that you can do all those things mm -hmm. with. Right. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then I would say that I really try to make sure that I find time to take care of myself like my skin right That's so amazing. i try to book facials so i'm mm -hmm. doing that or i'm you know just taking care of it on a daily basis mm -hmm. and eating well and drinking lots of water and mm -hmm. all the things that they tell you <laughs> exactly you know do you have a spiritual life or how do you describe your spirituality 
I grew up Catholic. I have had a back and forth love hate relationship with the church mm -hmm. for obvious reasons and then just personal reasons. I found a, an incredible church when I was living in California that I loved going to and I miss because I cannot find a church like that mm -hmm. in New York. You know, I find that I want to go to church. I want to be served up some sort of message on a mm -hmm. weekly basis to go into my week with an intention or a reminder. But when I go to church and the priests are just regurgitating exactly what we just heard, and there's no true like conversation with us to mm -hmm. inspire us, it makes it hard to want to go to church. Mm -hmm. So I can find that sort of inspiration through different things. Look, I find people on Instagram that are speaking some sort of like reminder of how to treat yourself, how to treat others, mm -hmm. just whatever. If you can find things that will click with you, that are like, yeah, yeah, that didn't resonate with me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a proponent of therapy, you mm -hmm. know, not just in crisis, but like, and again, therapy, life coach, whatever you want to right. call it, somebody who is on your team mm -hmm. to navigate life, whether it's personal relationships or business relationships, your inner relationship, call you on your bullshit. Mm -hmm. Or things are good, so what do you want next? Like, mm -hmm. let's talk about the next step. Where do you want to go? Where do you, mm -hmm. you know, like helping you navigate mm -hmm. with your direction? Because yeah. you can't always get that from friends. You can find it in friendships, right? But not on a weekly basis mm -hmm. with neutrality. Mm -hmm. and, and that's the same with a partner, right? You know, it's nice to have that other person that you can it's right. True. It's not so emotionally attached and can kind of see yeah. things, but yet knows you. Speaking of navigating into the future, where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? Geez, that would put me at 62. Mm -hmm. So honestly, I hope I'm still working. Yeah. And looking at Jamie Lee Curtis yes. yeah. last week, yeah. I think that there's a lot of opportunities for women to work through all these different streaming services. And the film industry is a little narrow right now. So I feel like that's going through a lot of change. But there's a lot of opportunities on television for women. So I'd like to keep awesome. working and pushing myself in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, it'd be fun to still try to do some directing. Who knows if there's another book in me. I think yeah. there will be because I really enjoy doing books. I'm always so proud of having them. Yeah, let's talk about your books and the book you think might still be in you. So we love this book, yes. Our Shoes Ourselves, right? Yeah. So tell us how it came to be. Isn't it a pretty book? It's a really it pretty really book. Is. 40 women, 40 stories, 40 pairs of shoes. It's a beautiful book. Yeah. And the photography is gorgeous. I had broken my foot and had a major surgery on my foot, so I can't fit into any of my old shoes, my Natasha platform. Uh, okay. I can't fit into all these incredible shoes that I used to buy, wasted so much money on purchasing, <laughs> I must say. How tall are you, Bridget? I'm 5'10". 5'10". So you would wear really high shoes. Yeah, that's, no, that's awesome. I loved it. <laughs> And then being in New York, where I don't have a lot of storage in my apartment, I would kind of move my winter boots out and, and put it in storage and bring my spring shoes in. Like, you know, that was a rhythm. And I kept moving these shoes in and out. I'm like, I'm never going to wear these. I can't even fit them on my foot anymore. But I didn't want to just get rid of them because as I took each one out, I was like, oh, this is from Sex and the City. Oh, this is from that premiere. Or, oh, this is from this. My boots that I wore in Africa on a safari, whatever it was. I was thinking, well, if I have this many memories attached to these shoes, I bet other women do. And I called my friend Amanda Benchley, who has done, gosh, I think she's coming out with her third or fourth book this wow. month. I told her what was going on, and she said, there's a book in this. I was like, okay, let's explore it. And we did, and we pitched it, and now there's yes. a book. And we spent a lot of time trying to think of people in different industries and backgrounds and ages so that we could highlight a lot of different people. And I also realized like I didn't have any mentors and 
again, we lived in a period of time that there wasn't Instagram. Like that's one of the things that I feel like social media is great is that, mm -hmm. about is that you can really get inspired from people all over the world, which back in Longmeadow, Massachusetts, my world wasn't that mm -hmm. wide open. So going through this process and talking to these women and learning their stories or learning who they are, when I was sending out notices to ask people to participate, I was really inspired by all these women. So that was the goal was to inspire like the next generation to be bold and take yeah. that step and that chance. You write dedicated to Eloise, Annabelle, Maeve, Claire, Mabel, Ellen, Alice, Katie, Phoebe, Georgie, Violet, Ella, Drew, Rosie, Wilhelmina, Wilhelmina, and all the girls and women out there who have a dream but maybe don't know how to take their first step. Hopefully some of the footsteps yeah. we trace in the following pages will show you that you aren't alone and also inspire you to forge your own path. That's really beautiful. It's just, a, like you said, just a beautiful book. And Doro, you have yeah. two family members. I know, right, Bridget. I'm so honored <laughs> that they're in your book. My mother, who used to wear Ked sneakers, and she had maybe, I don't even know how many pairs, a million, <laughs> and she'd wear a different color on each foot. And people would say, yeah. Mrs. Bush has, Mrs. Bush is She's losing, losing it. it. Yeah. I love that photo of her. She looks so beautiful she there. Does. She does. I love so that photo. Beautiful. She was amazing. And my, and my Lauren. niece, Lauren, who has launched a feed bag business and yeah. been a social mm -hmm. entrepreneur. But the book is amazing. It is. So what's the next one? Do you know it yet? And you have your cookbook. No. So yeah. Yes. I have the cookbook. Yeah. The cookbook was inspired from all the different family meals that we have on Blue Blood. That's so fun. Yes. Yeah transition to do something like that and there's a lot of my family recipes in there from my mom and then other people's and cast members i'm not responsible for all those <laughs> recipes but there are some in there that i treasure being able to just go oh my yeah i need that recipe and then i can yeah then you just got it you gotta live your own book for that <laughs> yeah we should it'd be so fun for you to do another book on bravery and yeah. courage we think it doesn't have to be all out there and all loud. You do it privately and you it's your inner strength that can carry you. And you just embody that. Yeah. Right? So you really do. Just, but we just love that we get to know you and we're just so excited about our friendship. Yes. <laughs> you know, life is funny. You know, as we get older, we were talking about sometimes your friend circle does get a little tighter. Can you talk about that? I've noticed in the last couple of years that like friends I've had for 20 years sometimes might have to take a different role and maybe be put a little bit out on the farther mm -hmm. circles. And I feel like you just need those people in your inner circle to be those trusted people. But that doesn't mean I'm not open to right. friendships. And I think that that's one of the wonderful lessons I've learned over the last couple of years. It's like, if you meet somebody special and who makes you laugh and <laughs> inspires you, like latch on to that person and like be open to them coming in and be open to sharing yourself because you want to have those type of people in your life. And there's always room for those type of people. Mm -hmm. I'm always excited when I meet somebody new. And that's one of the things from all the different. Yeah, yeah that you carry them with you, I would imagine. Is that on each one, you pull an experience or somebody yeah. from, right? So that low budget film I was doing when I was got Stex in the City and Cayo Reagli. In the weeds? Yeah. The film didn't have a big release, but I met one of my best friends in the world from that. Like I'm able to recognize that there is value in those experiences, mm. even if it's not the monetary or the film success right. of it. I seem to be able to find somebody of value on all my projects that become great friends. Cherry with you. We're honored to be your friend. May I love you. We are so Yay. thrilled that you came on our podcast today. Yes. And thank you for sharing so much with us. And we just look forward to seeing you again. And I know our listeners will love hearing about your life. So thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doro. Be well. <laughs>